In this final part of the last 5 mile series we wave goodbye to Brick Kiln Bridge and once again head east towards Greywell Tunnel. Now as you can see it really is beautiful along here and the sunny weather makes it that much better. As I've said before, here where the canal has water it doesn't look at all abandoned. Coming up in a short distance is a small branch heading north away from the canal for 100 metres or so. So while the main line heads to the right, the branch takes a left turn. And just look at that, isn't that beautiful? And ahead is another bridge which we'll investigate after. But first, let's go and have a look at Upnately Brickworks. So this is the start of the brickworks arm, which serves obviously the brickworks. Over there you can see a brick edge, which were once wharves all made from the local brick when narrow boats once tied up. Just prior to the canal being constructed, the original planned route would have followed the arm here, headed north some three and a half miles around Rotherwick with an extra arm to Turgis Green. After rounding Rotherwick, it would head south again before levelling off to turn east, just west of Odium Castle. However, this met opposition amongst the late 18th century landowners, who weren't too enamoured about a canal cutting through their land, and despite being given permission to build, an alternative route was also given the go-ahead to construct the current route by way of a tunnel beneath Greywell Hill. So we come to the end of the towpath as far as we can go but at the end here we got some interesting brickworks and ruins now I'm assuming that this was part of the old brickworks we've got some brick steps there and look at those aren't they wonderful and then over here So we've got a wall here with a bit of a, a conduit going underneath. Obviously, that would lead to the canal. We've got some stagnant water in it. And it'd be interesting to know just what this area was because it's on the other side and our wall continues over here it's not in the greatest state of repair although this tree is ripping it to pieces and it sort of ends abruptly there a quick look onto the National Library of Scotland and the area I've just looked at reveals absolutely nothing. Now this map is dated 1909, so just at the end of the brickwork's life. So I think that the crumbling brickwork that we saw is nothing more than to shore up the brickwork's canal arm. So let's go back up the stairs, back onto the towpath and in front of me in the canal, we've got two metal posts or brackets now what were they used for were they part of a jetty who knows i think we've upset the local dogs and there's another post a wooden one this time just there so let's fast forward a bit now i've come back to the brickworks arm branch a few months after the filming it's now the end of august 2022 and i've come here to look for something specifically and it looks like it's paid off because have a look at this beauty into the canal which is so dry 
Now it hasn't rained properly for months and it's exposed this. And that is a barge called the Seagull. even got the propeller and the prop shaft look at that now literature says it's a 70 foot long steam powered narrowboat the engine was taken out in 1985, I think it was, and it's now in the National Waterways Museum in Gloucester as an exhibit. And here is the Seagull's engine, built by A.J. Bignall, engineers and boilermakers of Stony Stratford in Buckinghamshire in 1890. The single cylinder engine was capable of 12 horsepower and is thought to be the only remaining steam narrowboat engine. But he didn't say what happened to the boat itself. Well, we now know it's still here and that is absolutely brilliant. So starting with the bows of the boat, we've got this lovely bit of ironwork here. I think that nail is in the old bank there, uh, which in part of the wharf. And obviously comes down here and goes down to the bottom of the boat. Would it be a keel on a narrow boat or is it flat bottomed? I think it's flat bottomed anyway. This piece of wood here, which would have been attached at one point, it's all rotted away up here. The hull has been exposed just down there. There's a bit of a gap where it's drying out. And then if we turn this way, we can look at the boat, which emerges out of the mud even more as we go along. And then by the time we get up to here, this is the area where the engine would have sat. We've got some metal struts. We've got some more of the hull has been exposed there. We've got some metal strengtheners and struts here, and this is where the engine would have been sat in this area here. Probably what looks like a couple of planks here. And then we've got your shaft, your prop shaft, and if you look here, where the mud has dried out, you can see a great view of the hull. And so we've got our prop shaft going there, we've got more struts, and then it ends up with this absolutely wonderful propeller now where that house stands today and all of the site on the opposite bank is the location of the upnately brickworks it was set up by sir frederick seeger hunt who purchased the canal in 1895 and bricks have been made here for a good 100 years prior but he sought to produce them on a much grander scale and so the Hampshire Brick and Tile Company emerged in 1897. Trade was initially successful as the need for bricks in London and the not too distant army barracks in Aldershot were in demand. Alas the merchandise produced here was less than satisfactory due to the clay used being found to be unsuitable and as a result, the brickworks ceased production in 1908. So we'll leave the brickworks branch behind us now, and we're gonna follow the main line again. So we're back on the canal, that's where we've come from. It takes a dog leg to the right and in front of us we have another bridge and this one looks particularly beautiful because we've got plenty of water and the reeds coming out 
makes it look really atmospheric. This is Slade's Bridge. Once again, we've got the brick lined towpath going under, and we've also got a bizarre wooden structure, a wooden bridge. I've no idea what that is for. Although I would be interested to know what the indent is for on the other side. There was one on Brick Kiln Bridge. And there's also one here, but these bricks look relatively modern. So is that is that a flood defence maybe? Now, one interesting thing on slades, you've got the rope marks where the horses were towing the barges and the rope has cut into the bridge there, into the brick. That's a real retainer. off the canal and I'm on the north side of Slade's Bridge you can just see it there and we're on the road because apparently there's remains of the brickworks that still exists and I can see it now in fact I can see two I'd only heard there was one but it looks like there's two we've got this structure to our right like an arch sitting there I I may be wrong but I seem to recall reading somewhere that it's the entrance arch. And on the other side of the road, we have a similar but smaller structure. And that seems to be on private land, so we're not going to look too deeply at that one. But this one, I can have a close look at. Now considering it's reputed that the bricks that were made at this brickwork weren't of good quality, considering it's been closed for 121 years, those bricks aren't in too bad a condition. So I'm just going to have a walk through because I'm hoping that there might be a date brick or even a a brick with a maker's mark on it. So we're on the other side. And I can't see anything. But even so, I wonder why that was left because the rest of the brickworks has long since gone. It's been built on over that side, but only very recently. But what was it? Was it the entrance? One possible suggestion, because you've got the other arch over there, the other side of Tony, was there a bridge going over here? But a bridge for what reason? And going where? Because the brickworks was over there. I suppose a look on the maps will sort that out. So looking at the 1909 map, our two brick arches are clearly visible. You can see them here. This is the smaller one that's in the private garden. And this is the bigger one, which I walked through. And the road today comes up here and through the two of them. Now it's said 
that the brickworks had its own railway, or probably more of a tramway for moving bricks around the works. I've also read that the arches were once supports for a railway bridge. Looking at the map, the way our two arches line up in relation to this building here. Now you look at it here. It's quite easy to imagine if a bridge was put over these two arches, it could easily carry a railway into the brickworks or into this particular building. And also, if we look just to the north of the site, look what's directly opposite. We've got the clay pits, and that was the area where the clay um, was taken out of the ground to make the bricks, and it's directly in line with this building, and bang in the middle are our two arches. So it's quite probable that a railway or a tramway did come from the clay pits over these two arches and into this building. Well, I've just stopped. I mean, the fact that it's absolutely beautiful is reason enough to stop. But I've just noticed I'm just east of Slade's Bridge, and I've noticed how wide this cutting is. So we've got the obvious canal in the middle, and if you look up there, you've got one edge of the canal bank, and it rises maybe 30 foot. And then if we go the other side, we've got the other bank, and that rise is obviously the same, but look how wide it is. That's a good 20, 30 feet away. And instead of the sheer sides that we had a little tunnel, we've got a gradual slope. And once again, that's, that's a massive engineering feat because this, this cutting has been going on now for a few hundred yards and continues as far as the eye can see at the moment. So if you cast your mind back to the first part of this this series, the first bridge or the site of it after leaving Basingstoke Basin by the bus station was called East Drop Bridge. This bridge in front of us is called East Drop Bridge. And that's the confusing part. Two bridges on the same canal with exactly the same name. Are these bridges are all made of brick so it's all the same sort of construction but don't the creepers hanging down don't they look brilliant we've got a little bit of muddy water there and once again if you look on the the corner of this bridge we've got the rope marks from the uh, where the horses would have towed the barges and this one goes all the way up there. So I'm going to walk up on top of the bridge. Look at all this fantastic wild garlic growing either side of me. If we had smelly vision, you'd certainly be able to smell it as well. It's absolutely beautiful. So here's the, the road on top. I think it's just an occupation bridge, farmers crossing. And there's a the view on one side, a little bit obscured by the tree and vegetation, but nonetheless wonderful. And that's looking towards Basingstoke, and this one looking east. Once again, quite obscured by vegetation. There is water down there, I can assure you of that. Not much, but there is water down there. And so now we're going to move on. So the last feature in this series and that's our end of the line and that's Greywell Tunnel. Now look at the look at the depth of this cutting and the width of it. It's got even wider and even higher. That's got to be 40 foot plus over there. It's very deep, it's as deep as the cutting as we go east from Old Basing just as we pass Cuckoo Bridge. We've still got some water in there, although not a great deal. But look how picturesque and beautiful this is. And then we've got the other bank sloping up there, past all the wild garlic. This place is absolutely stunning. So 
So we're now coming up to the western portal of Greywell Tunnel. Still got a bit of water in the canal down there. But the canal itself actually ends abruptly here. But here's one of the feeds, one of the, the springs that feeds the canal coming out of the ground. Look, look at that, it's actually coming out of the rock there. How lovely is that? And then trickling down to the canal. So looking by the the spring that's coming out there, flowing into the canal, it drew me to this. And then I realized that all along here is stone lined. Now obviously this is the edge of the canal. So was this a wharf with boats tied up here waiting to go into the canal? I think we know that only one boat at a time could go in. You can see it's stone because it's it's so straight lined. It'd be interesting to know what the other side would be like, although in fact I can see just over there some stone as well. So it's it's too narrow. It's far too narrow to be a tying up area. It's probably just a strengthener to keep the walls of the cutting falling in. A very wide cutting, very shallow slopes again. And if you look here, these, these bars have actually been inserted, obviously long after the canal closed, to keep the stone walls from collapsing in. So this is one bank here, which is stone lined, and that's another bank that's stone lined. So it's very narrow, just enough room for one boat. And then obviously from here, it would take its route into the tunnel. Completed in 1794, the tunnel stretches 1,230 yards beneath Growell Hill. In 1932, pressure from ponds which had formed above the canal caused it to partially collapse. Another collapse occurred in the 1950s, blocking it completely, and a more recent one in 2019 has confounded the tunnel's integrity further, dismissing any hopes of ever reopening it. So coming round to the side of the tunnel, we've got more brickwork there. It looks very fragile, probably on the on the verge of falling down again. And that's that's the original portal would have come out here. Most of it's now encased in moss. It doesn't get a lot of sunlight here, only in the summer really. But all that is brickwork under there. But where the trees have grown into it, it's dislodged all the bricks. And you can see there on the edge how precarious they are. And bearing in mind that would have come out quite some distance. Unfortunately the tunnel and the portal were long gone. Let's have a look over the other side. We've got these bricks up here equally as precarious. And if you look in the ground you can see quite a lot of evidence of bricks. We've got some down here on the floor by the spring and over there in the spring. These are all parts of the tunnel. Let's have a look up here. So we've got these, you can see a few more in there. From every different angle you can see more of the brickwork. But most of it has now been covered over with vegetation. Let's not forget that this canal hasn't been used for over 110 years since the last boat came through here, and that was in 1912. Sealed off today, you can't get in there, unfortunately, or fortunately, whichever way you look at it. But you can see the portal shape. We've got a couple of boats in there. If I shine a torch in there, the light's going to be diffracted away because of the daylight. So what we'll do, we'll come back in the darkness and we'll see if we can get some better results.
but we're going to say goodbye to the western portal of Greywell Tunnel now and we're going to try to navigate our way over the top of it to see what we can find and hopefully see if there's any shafts visible or even possibly locate where the collapse happened back in the 1930s I think it was but first something Tony pointed out just a minute ago off to my left and we've got what looks like a concrete structure now what could that be that's very odd it's defined because there's a gap running around it in fact it's on bricks if you put the light on you can see it's on blue bricks we've also got a hole here it's uh well, that's quite deep and in fact you can see brickwork going down about eight or nine courses so i have no idea what that is and this looks this stone here looks worked is it anything to do with the tunnel portal in relation to the portal originally it was there today it's around here so it's running slightly behind our anomaly must be something to do with the canal though let's continue So we're now crossing over the top of the tunnel. So going east is that way. And you can just see some water down there. And there's the cage and our tunnel portal as it is today is just there. So let's follow the path and see where it takes us. So it looks like we're in the middle of nowhere and that's exactly how it feels. The western portal for Greywell is over there beyond those trees. We've walked on a west-east alignment away from the western portal as best we can. We think we're bang on but what we're looking for now is the where the cave-in happened. Now this area here you can tell by the ground it did contain water but it's because we're in that in the drought it's dried out considerably which allows me to walk in this bit however if i turn the camera around walking in this dry bit we still got a bit of water here and whereas this is relatively flat what we have here is a very sudden drop in the ground and if you look at the edges Something like that can only be either man-made or something catastrophic has happened where the ground has given way. It doesn't look natural and that, it looks like a sinkhole of some description where what was on top and it's stated that the, the collapse happened because of water build up on top and the weight caused the roof to collapse. This is the sort of thing if the roof collapses and, and the ground gives way, it will drop and it will create a sinkhole just like this. I think we're pretty bang on the alignment of the connect of the tunnel, which I'm certain is down there. And I think if we look on maps, particularly on LiDAR, that might confirm it. But if you look at these edges, they, they're very sheer. They're not, you know, it's as if something has very quickly given way. And the pond or pool sort of stops there and in fact if I look over here bearing in mind we're still carrying on a west-east alignment so let's stand here there's our pool that I was just on the other side of that's west if we turn east we've got another one here and it's of exactly the same geographical or topographical 
the, the sides, it, it looks as though it's collapsed very quickly and created a sinkhole. And as I say, unless it's man-made, and there wouldn't be a shaft this close to the... Because we're only a couple of hundred yards away from the western portal. So I think we are on top, or right bang on with the, the tunnel collapses. Here's the map from 1910 with the western portal of Grey Roll Tunnel here and the tunnel itself marked as it heads east. Now let's switch to LiDAR and this is where we were stood and the place where we think the collapse is located. So if we mark that position and then return to the 1910 map and you can clearly see that we were indeed in exactly the right place. So there you are, we found the site of the 1932 collapse. I'm on the eastern side of Greywell Hill now, and in the village of Greywell itself. Now this short footpath will take me to the top of the eastern portal of the tunnel. Just coming up to the top of the portal now. So here we see the canal heading east, and about a quarter of a mile away is a boom across the water which signifies the navigation limit and from here on the Basingstoke Canal is an operating canal once more. Now continuing along here will take me onto the towpath. So we turn right here down this hill, the little path going off to my right you can just see it there. And it's quite, it's a bit hairy at times, particularly when it's wet as it has been. So I've got to take it easy, I don't want to lose a limb. these couple of steps and there you can see the eastern portal of Greywell Tunnel and the end of our journey.